Hello and welcome to our first video lecture for Secondary Ed 419. I figured that we would switch things up uh, in Module 3 and instead of having readings for you I would go ahead and record some notes so that you guys could hear some things and just kind of talk a little bit more about the actual presentation of a novel uh, as you go to work with your students. So just switching things up a little bit using some different technology. Uh, I'll be using Presentation Tube for these, which is a subsidiary of YouTube and is free. So as you move forward in your own technological work as a teacher, this might be something you want to use with your students. So I'm going to go ahead and turn off the camera so that you don't have to look at my face in computer glare the entire time. And our first presentation here tonight is about the basics of teaching a novel. So we're really breaking things down to the very bottom level of getting ready to work with your students. For you guys who are English majors, this is going to seem like bottom basement English knowledge. And that's okay, because we want to talk about really what it means to get into a book with your students. So when we teach a book, what do we actually do? The place that I want you to start as you start to think about processing with the book are those basic narrative elements, the building blocks that become deeper understanding as we move forward. All the great understanding and great deep conversations you're going to have about a book have to start somewhere. And for educational purposes, they usually start at the very bottom level of literature. So we're talking about books with deep themes and ideas. These are still the core concepts that we want to start with. These are still the places we want to make sure that our students understand and can lay their finger on any time they need to as you're working your way through a novel. Personally, a lot of times as I'm reading, these are kind of the things I focus on. And I save some of that deeper analysis for once they have the entire book finished or sections of the book so that they're able to talk about it that way. So those core narrative elements are going to be plot, setting, and character. When I said basic, I meant basic. So we're going back to the very bottom level, plot, setting, and character. Things that your students should have learned in elementary school. These are terms that should be universal. Some years I have actually started second day of school by working with these three uh, definitions, looking at a short story, pulling things out simply to review them and make sure that my students have a solid grasp on these most basic levels of literary understanding. So we'll start with plot. All the definitions I'm going to use in this PowerPoint are mine. Um, I did not pull them from another literary source, but these are what I use with my 8th graders and what I used with my 6th graders before them and 7th graders. And they are very base level definitions. I found that they've worked very well, so feel free to steal, pilfer, or borrow, whatever you uh, feel comfortable calling it, as you move into your own classrooms. My definition for plot has always been the main problem of the story and the events that lead to its solution. Sitting there on the idea that in order to have any kind of story, any kind of conflict, there has to be a problem. We have to present a problem to our readers in order to have them interested in the book. If nothing occurs, then you don't have very interesting literature. Or it's a Samuel Beckett play. Either or. The basic plot structure that they should have learned in elementary school, but one that I always like to go back over, is that of Freytag's Pyramid. And as you can see in the illustration that I put on here, this is your basic plot pyramid. We have an introduction or an exposition sequence. There's an inciting incident, something that spikes the story to get started. We have our conflict or rising action, which comes to the top of climax. We have falling action, which reaches some sort of resolution, and then denouement. Now, we as English majors and we as teachers of literature understand that this is a very malleable structure that this structure can be altered, it can be reformed, and it can be done in different ways. But before you can learn how to make it change, you have to have that basic structure in front of your students. Often, once I draw this up and give them a handout with this Freytag's Pyramid, I'll put the word change smack dab in the middle, making sure that they understand that any plot has to be about change that the characters are going through. So as we're talking about plot, and once we get that concrete idea of Freytag's Pyramid down, the question to start to ask is, okay, so how does the novel follow this, or how does it adapt those basic plot structures? Do we have a media array? Does it start in the middle of the action? One of my favorite examples for this is to talk about the Iliad, or to talk about the Odyssey. You know, realizing that when we meet Odysseus and he's laying there on Circe's island, he's been there for quite some time. There's a lot of things that have happened first. Talk about Star Wars with my kids. The first time that we open up in the Star Wars uh, trilogy, the original movie, Things have gone on much longer before the movies actually begin. And as a reader, that sets up different expectations. We can talk about flashback in our study of plot. How does that affect the plot? How do we get a chance to move backwards in time to see what's occurred? We'll talk about point of view in another module, but think about how point of view and changes in point of view characters can affect plot. 
And all this takes us back to our study of Freytag's pyramid, looking at how those different things happen. What happens in that introduction? What happens in that rising action, that climax, that big moment of the story? What happens if we move them around a little bit? Is that what the author's doing to us? Are they trying to change the tension that's being built by moving us in different points of the plot? As you study plot with your students, get them to ask what if questions. To think about, okay, so what if this happened? What if this occurred? What if we change some of the different plot events? What if we look at an event in a story and say, well, what if Pony Boy doesn't run into that church? How does that change the plot? What if, at the end of the story, Johnny lives? How does that change the plot? What does it change as things go on? This gets the students to consider what's happening in the plot, to get them to consider what's going on, how things are changing, how the plot is having effects, and how it ripples throughout. This is just good core understanding. It's forcing them to think about what the author's doing and how that plot's coming together. A lot of times I'll ask my students to illustrate or storyboard the actions in the plot to force them to think about it in a visual format as opposed to simply going from text and to try to take an idea of what is actually happening, trying to get that action that's going on. If you have kids who are great at art but struggle with reading, this is a great go-to activity. Have them storyboard what happened and have them share it with the rest of the class. Have them share it with their teammates so they can see what's going on with that story and the plot that's happening. Another thing as we work with some of our older students is start to connect the language to plot events. How does the sentence structure affect what's happening in the plot? Author works with short, simple, choppy sentences. Does that affect what's going on? We get these long, beautiful, complex sentences with lots of commas and semicolons and they're an English major's dream. Do they affect the plot? Did the author do it on purpose? Is that sentence structure actually giving us an idea as to the actions that are going on? Can't talk about plot without talking about conflict. You will see a lesson like this in almost every grade, I'm sure, as you talk about conflict with your students. There are six types of conflict that are often talked about, and I'm giving you five here that I use with my own students so you have an idea. And again, this knowledge forces kids to analyze what's happening. It forces them to think about other connections that they can make in the different types of conflict when they see these popping up. It helps them bring different schema or different background information to the novel that they're reading. So the five that we can talk about are person versus person. This is your one-on-one -on -one conflict. This is when one character has a conflict with another. I often call this the superhero supervillain conflict. So my students can get an idea of that one-on-one -on -one idea. But it doesn't have to be a physical conflict. This is the same conflict between two characters in a romance. This is the same conflict between two characters who are on differing sides of an opinion where they're arguing with each other. And this conflict is one of the more common conflicts that we will see in the youngest of young adult literature. Person versus self starts to really show up in young adult literature aimed for middle teens, and it becomes kind of one of the main ideas that we see popping up again. That search for identity. Who am I going to be? That fight that the uh, characters are having within themselves for what am I? What do I stand for? What are my goals? What are my opportunities towards me? What do I want to see in the future? This is a conflict that your students are going to lock in on very easily. They're going to see it, they're going to analyze it, they're going to understand it. We've talked about making connections with readers, and this is a place where young adult authors can often make a very good connection as they build these types of conflicts into their story. The third one has become incredibly popular in young adult literature. Well, I'd say over the last few years, but uh, you just read a book that was focusing on conflict of person versus society as well. As we start to look at where does the character fit in in society? Uh, again, it's a search for identity. Now it's not so much as the war within the mind, but looking at the world outside. Where do I fit in? What is my role? Where do I fit in the society? In a few weeks, we'll read The Hunger Games, which is a huge analysis of a society that is corrupt and how the individual can try to stand up against it. We'll read The Giver, which is one of the most beautiful uh, pictures of not fitting in and what it means and what it means to not fit in and what it means to stand on your own values when the whole world is against you. The next one down is person versus nature, the survival conflict, also called the Hemingway theory. Uh, there's a great young adult book that I did not put in the syllabus called Hatchet. It's definitely on the very bottom end of young adult literature. It's almost uh, late elementary. But the kids love this book. You know, I've taught it to sixth graders, and I've actually taught it to seventh graders in a literature circle study. And the book is basically a survival story of a young man who gets dropped into the wilderness and has to survive. And that person versus nature conflict shows how a person can struggle versus nature and what they learn from that. 
The fifth one that I've put on my different types of conflict is person versus technology. I expect that we're going to see this becoming very popular again. You know, this is kind of the foundation of the science fiction movement that happens in the 1950s and 1960s in sci-fi literature. The question of, you know, what is our role in an increasingly technological society? Uh, Isaac Asimov, Philip K. Dick uh, did a lot of work with this. And some of their works uh, have trickled down. And you might even see them in your curriculum as you start to teach, especially at the high school level. But young adult authors are also starting to explore this. What is the role of the individual in a world of technology? What do we do when our technology threatens to dehumanize us, threatens to replace us, threatens to make the world insignificant, threatens to change our ability to interact? And this type of conflict is starting to show up, as I said, more and more. The next core narrative element of the three that I want to talk about tonight is setting. And my definition for setting is very basic, you know, where and when the story takes place. And it's probably the narrative element that we tend to blow off the most. Uh, it's a narrative element that we sort of take for granted and we push past. But in young adult literature, it's so incredibly important because the settings are often so varied and so well developed and so essential, essential, excuse me, to the plot that they're going to be reading. So we think about setting, ask your students, what are the defining components? And I mean defining components. What is it about this setting that makes it unique, especially for this novel? And as you guys read Percy Jackson this week, I really want you to, too, pay attention to the setting and look at the way that Riordan creates this world, uh, this world that lives kind of in parallel to our own, the little nods that he gives to his fantasy world in almost every description of a place, trying to get the kids to see that this is classical illusion, trying to pull that information together in this book in particular, but in any novel that we give, really, what defines the setting? Is it the cultural expectations? Are we working on a novel like Roll of Thunder, Here Might Cry by Mildred Taylor, which is set during the heyday of Jim Crow? You can't teach that novel without really looking at the cultural mores and the cultural expectations that the people are living with in the South at that time. Is it the poverty of the Great Depression? Are we reading Steinbeck and being able to have that conversation? Or is it a question of the fantasy elements? If you go teach a book like Harry Potter, or even like Percy Jackson. You know, what are the seven components that make it different, that are jarring to us? When you read The Giver next week, that world seems so familiar and easy to put your finger on, but yet there's a sense of wrongness throughout it. And having your students look for that wrongness and be able to talk about it is very powerful in getting them to interpret what's going on in the book. Again, your artistic students are great to illustrate the setting. Uh, sometimes I'll have my very artistic kids draw pictures and just hang them up in the room so that we can have a visual of what our characters might be seeing, what their interpretation is. Again, language. How is language used to develop setting? Sometimes it's not as obvious as in the plot. Especially we can look at things like figurative language, simile, metaphor, imagery, the way it's being used. A lot of times I like to literally break out those similes, those metaphors, and talk about what words are being compared here. What's the connotation that those words at the tail end of those comparisons really elicits in the mind of the reader? And have the students start to build an idea about mood. You know, it's another one of the more complex literary elements, but we can talk about it through setting. Again, what if questions? What if the setting changes? Can the plot survive in a different setting? Can we have the same story if we change the setting? Or is the setting essential? And then can we pull out what parts are the essential, those defining components again? What makes the setting so important to telling the story that the author is trying to tell? Concepts like dialect, cultural mores I already talked about, historical facts all come into a conversation about setting. Dialect is so much fun when you get a novel that's very well written with very extensive dialect. Uh, while not considered you know, modern young adult, uh, teaching Twain is always fascinating to talk about dialect and try to work your way through with that with students. The idea about historical facts, if it's a piece of historical fiction, have your students analyze, you know, what is this world like? A little bit of nonfiction research going into a historical fiction novel goes a very long way. Having the students present what the world is like. Having the students present the ideas of even when the book was written. For example, if you're teaching Percy Jackson 10 years from now, it wouldn't hurt to have students sit down and do an analysis of what the world was like in the middle 2000s when Riordan was writing the book. Uh, I just got done the middle of the year teaching a novel called Walk Two Moons, and the novel was written in the early 90s. And I always have the students do a quick analysis of the time period and say, so what's going to be one of the biggest defining factors? And as they go through and they think about history, finally some intelligent student always says, oh my God, they don't have cell phones. <laughs> 
It's a small thing, but for your students, it's a totally different way of looking at the world and asking questions about the story. Our third and final core narrative element is character. And I define characters as the personalities who play a role in a story. It's a very broad, open definition, but focusing on that idea of personality who plays a role, a person who does something to do in the story, a person who acts upon the plot, a person who exists within the setting, the idea that these are those core things that have to happen in order to even have a story. Uh, when you're first talking about narrative elements with your students and these core narrative elements, ask them if a story can exist without any of the three. Can you have a story without a plot? Do you have a frozen picture of characters standing on a background? Can you have a story without characters? Well, you'd have a setting. You'd have a problem that has to be solved, but there's no one there to solve it. Can you have a story without a setting? You'd have characters who knew they had to solve a problem, but they would just be floating in the void going, I have something to do and I can't do it. Basic character type. Very basic level thing. Before we get talking about more complex ideas about character later on, protagonist, antagonist, and supporting characters. One thing I try to stay away from is, you know, who's the good guy of the story? Because as we get into young adult literature, those labels of good and bad tend to become kind of trite. And they don't quite apply as much as they used to in some of the literature the kids read when they were younger. Asking them about a protagonist, that character that we're supposed to relate to. Who are we supposed to connect to? The antagonist, who's the major challenge against that character? Who's standing against them? And then other characters who pepper the story and add to it. As you ask kids to start to talk about character, I always like to talk about traits. Physical, yes, important. We get that picture painted in our heads of who these people are, but also personality. One thing my students have trouble with sometimes is transient personality traits versus more concrete and permanent personality traits. They'll often say, well, that's, that character is nice. And the question I always come back to is, were they nice in that one particular moment in the story, or is that something a little more ingrained in who they are? Is it something that the author has developed about who they really are as a character? And having your students ask those types of questions about themselves, trying to figure out what are their actual character traits, the things that define who they are, and then trying to analyze characters from a novel is a very worthwhile activity. Character motivations play a huge part in analyzing character and analyzing literature. Have your students ask, why is this character doing what he or she is doing? What is causing them to do it? It's great conversation topics early on in a book. You, know, you get to that point where the character is about to embark on whatever the main plot of the story is. And you say, so what, what's, why are they doing it? Why are they able to set out there? What is driving them? Is it a sense of honor? Is there an outside force acting on them? Is it a sense of just their character would not let them stand by and not engage in this plot? Getting the characters defined through their motivations allow the students to understand the story much better. And then relationships. How do the characters relate to each other? This can be very complex in certain novels to allow your characters to trace and your students to trace to the relationships of the various characters. Uh, who likes who? Who's friends with who? Who has a grudge with who? How did they grow up together? I mean, just think about doing this through the outsiders and all the relationships amongst the various characters. This is a very fun activity to get the kids to latch on to who's who and how they all interrelate. When we talk about character, here's another lesson that you'll see in every grade you'll ever teach, and those are the methods of characterization. First, you have direct characterization, the idea that an author will come out and just tell us something about a character. And that's very foreign and more mature pieces of literature. We usually don't get that. Authors usually will show us as opposed to tell us, but it's worth talking about with your kids. But then, of course, we get into indirect characterization. We learn about a character by what they say. We learn about a character by their actions and what they do. We learn about them by what they think. If they're a viewpoint character and we're in either first person or a third person uh, point of view where we're able to see the character's thoughts, we can learn a lot about that narration. And then, of course, we can learn a lot by how others in the story interact with that character. This can take us back to the things I talked about before, motivation, relationships. You know, As we continue to look at these methods of characterization, they help us answer those bigger questions about character. Once you've talked about those core elements, or as you're talking about those core elements, have your students answer the questions about how they affect each other. How does the setting affect the plot? Again, you know, have a story that's set during the Depression. How does that setting define the problems that your students will have to face? How does the plot affect the characters? How do those actions change the characters as they move forward? 
I think I said it earlier in the presentation, but that key word for any type of literature for our students has to be change. What change is going on throughout this book? And then how does the plot cause that change within our characters? How does the setting affect the characters? Again, how does that world that they're living in, that they're being a part of, define who they are, define those traits, define those relationships and such? How do the characters affect the setting? Are the characters having an effect on the world? Are they changing it in any way? Are they able to manipulate the world? Is that part of what they're doing? And then finally, how do the characters affect the plot? The problems that are there, how are the characters putting their stamp on the events that happen? This is a foundation. It's there to build bigger and more complex ideas, but it is a good starting point for you and your students as you start to think about actually teaching a novel. I hope this wasn't too basic for anybody. I hope you got some value out of this. And as we move on to our next video lecture for this module, I'm going to talk about the archetypal approach to literary criticism and kind of how it affects these various things. So get a drink, relax for a little bit, and then join me for the next lecture whenever you are ready. Hold on. Have a good night.